recently, the question I've been asked the most is, Pastor, what do we do? I realized that when the moment I stepped into a position in ministry, and all of a sudden it went from being a student, and often asking the questions in class, to my professors of what is the assignment, or what am I supposed to do at this point, all of a sudden there are people now asking me, what are we supposed to do? Yesterday was my first day in the office, or back in the office after my honeymoon, and, and as the official minister of the church, uh, I stepped into my office, I sat there for a while, and uh, Mick had reminded us in class already that after he had unpacked his books and, and everything in his, in his room, and he sat there and he was thinking to himself, what am I supposed to do now? And I realized I had a moment to myself with that same question, what am I supposed to do now? And I realized at that very moment that Mick never told us the answer of what he did. And so I sat there and thought, okay, what am I supposed to do now? And I began to pray because the question that kept ringing in my head was, Pastor, what do we do? On Sunday, when I saw my car again, they said, Pastor, what do we do? Two sisters come up to me and, and ask about the nursery usage, and they go, Pastor, what do we do? And if you're in ministry, and you've been thrust from Talbot into ministry, and God's given you a position, and the first question that's been asked to you, Pastor, what do you do? Or what do we do? The church roof is leaking, and, and rainy season's coming, and there's no room in the budget for a new roof, Pastor, what do we do? A husband and a wife comes to you asking for counseling, and you find out later on they've already filed paperwork for a divorce. Pastor, what do we do? A dad comes to you sobbing, asking for, for, for help, for comfort. His wife's been diagnosed with stage four cancer, and he has three young children, and he looks to you, Pastor, what do we do? Pastor, what do you do? For those of us who are training to be pastors and ministers one day, that's a real question that we'd be asked. Pastor, what do we do? And, and many of us have, have come to Talbot in, in faithfulness and, and trusting that God would teach us things that would prepare us for a lifetime of ministry. And the pastors and the professors and the teachers here are, are outstanding and they teach you well. But yet when you're asked that question, Pastor, what do we do? At times you do not know what to do. And, and like me, I'm new to ministry. I've walked out of here prepared with four letters behind my name. MDiv somehow has accredited me to do the things they've called me to do. And a church has recognized me enough to say that you're going to be a pastor of our people. And yet, I find myself being asked that question, Pastor, what do we do? And not knowing the answer to it. At this point in the narrative, King Solomon has been put on the throne his father, King David, has just passed. King David was a great king, one of the best in Israel, and, and he follows huge shoes. Uh, and Solomon is placed on this throne. He is preparing himself for kingship over Israel, a great people at this time in the United Kingdom. He knows that Yahweh is God, and he knows all the things to do. He's now prepared himself a throne, and he's even married Pharaoh's wife, or Pharaoh's daughter and his, as his wife. In other words, he secured himself an alliance with Egypt. He's done everything politically and everything in his human eyes to prepare for his kingship. And, and he's thinking to himself, what else is there to do? How else can he prepare for kingship? And you and I have taken our Greek, our Hebrew, or attempted at it at least, we, we've taken our exegesis, we've taken our preaching classes, we've taken our practical ministry classes, we've taken everything that is supposed to prepare us for ministry, but what else are we missing? That if you're given a chance from God to ask whatever you wish of him, what would you ask for? What would that prayer be the first day you're in your church office? I sat there yesterday thinking, what am I supposed to pray for now? Am I supposed to pray for large attendance? Am I supposed to pray for more children's worker? Am I supposed to pray for a good budget? Am I supposed to pray for harmonious families? What am I supposed to pray for, Lord? If you were given the opportunity to prepare for a lifetime of ministry and God asked you, ask me of anything, what would you ask for? What would that prayer be that would set you up for ministry? If you have your Bibles, you would turn me to 1 King chapter 3. And we'll see what Solomon prays for. First King, First Kings chapter three.
First Kings chapter three. And what we're gonna see is that it's not only important to know what is the right, the right thing to pray for, but that we must also pray in the right posture. That before we ask God of anything, we must come before him in the right posture. So it's not only the right thing, but the right way in which we are to ask him. First Kings chapter three, join me in verse five. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. God said, ask, what should I give you? So in a dream, Solomon is asked by God, what should I give you? But notice in verse four, he says this, the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. Solomon went to Gibeon to sacrifice there because it was the most famous high place. He offered a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. So Solomon's coming before the Lord. Now he's married Pharaoh's wife. He's done everything he could. He's coming before God in worship and God appears to him in a dream. The first thing I want us to note is that before we ask God of anything, that we come to him in worship. That, that we come before God in a posture of humility, that we come before God seeking him, not the things that he can give us. That, that before we, we are willing to open our mouths to ask God, that we would be willing to open our ears to hear from him. That in other words, that before you have the right things to ask, you better have the right heart to approach God in. That, that, that God is not some genie that he's planned to conjure up. You see, Solomon didn't go with the intention of asking God of something that day. He, he went, he sacrificed, and God appeared to him asking him, Solomon, what should I give you? He said, ask. And Solomon decides to ask. And, and he could have prayed for a thousand things. He could have prayed for a strong army. He could have prayed for more wives. He could have prayed for a better kingdom. He could have prayed, prayed, prayed for unity for Israel. He could have prayed for whatever else that would make kings a king, a better economy. But what he decides to pray is really interesting. Notice, let's notice prayer here in verse six. And Solomon replied, you have shown great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity. He approaches God and he says, God, I thank you for my father because he had walked in your ways. He was faithful, he was righteous, he was, he was, he was with integrity, and, and, and he, he reminded himself of the great faithful love that God had shown David. Brothers and sisters, some of us are gonna be walking into ministry and you feel young, I feel young. I'm, I am young, my last name is Young. And the moment you walk into ministry and, 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 and God gives you this opportunity to ask of anything, remind yourself that you're not the first pastor in a pulpit. That, that God has called ministers and he has called people in leadership, that he has called people to ministry, that he's called his people to make disciples for generations. As we have sung this morning, that God's faithfulness extends to all generations. That, that even though Solomon is only the third king of Israel, he realizes there was one before him who did just fine, his father. He did not have a perfect life. He didn't, he didn't, live every, he didn't do everything that God called him to do, but God was faithful to him. That brothers and sisters, that as we approach ministry, as we prepare for ministry, may you remind yourself that God is faithful to his ministers, that God is faithful to those he calls, that God is faithful and that his love and kindness is everlasting. Beyond that, look what, he's, what, he's, what he says next in verse five, or verse six. He goes on. You have continued this great and faithful love for him by giving him a son to sit on the throne as it is today. That not only was God and Yahweh doing something for him in the past, in his faithfulness and his love for, for David, his father, but he realizes that, that God is doing something for him this day. That God's faithfulness not only put David on the throne, but now he has put him on the throne as well. That he realizes that even though he is king over Israel, the true king is Yahweh. You see, Solomon not only reminds himself that he didn't get there in his own accord, it wasn't he just born into that family, but God placed him there. 
And you and I may not be sitting on thrones and our kings this day. I hope that you're, you're not a king in your church. I, I, I tried that once, didn't work. Um, but that you would be reminded that you are standing in the pulpit that God has called you to. That, that even though you may not be royalty, even though you may not be a king over a nation, God has called us each and every week to stand in front of him in his pulpit in front of his people. To preach his word, to, 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 to lead in the way that he calls us to, to guide the ministry in the direction he calls us to. To be faithful to his word, to be obedient to his law, to be obedient to his statutes. That even though you and I are not kings, we stand in the pulpit of God and he has placed us there. So yesterday when I was sitting in my church office, I was thinking, God, how did I get here? <laughs> in a moment of, of sobering, you were thinking, man, this task is not easy. I've only been in that seat as a minister for two days and I realized ministry is not easy. It's hard. But, but as I read this passage, I'm reminded that as Solomon prayed that God is faithful in the past, but God is also faithful now to his people that he calls. It goes on. Verse seven, God's gonna tell, uh, Solomon's gonna pray a prayer of humility. He's gonna express to God his fears, his, his rawness, his, 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 his humility before the Lord that he's unable to do the things maybe God's calling him to do. Verse seven, Lord my God, you have now made your servant king in my father David's place. Yet I am just a youth with no experience in leadership, your servant is among your people, among your people you have chosen, a people too many to be numbered or counted. Notice what Solomon prays. He says to him, God, I'm just a youth. I'm young. The, the, the Hebrew literally says that, that, that I do not know my going out and my coming in. That, that he, he says to God that I have zero experience. You know, the one question I've been asked the most since Sunday is, how old are you? And the response is, wow, you're young. <laughs> and, and I asked God, God, what do you want me to do? Because everyone here thinks I'm just too young for this. Or, or God, you called me to this ministry, you've trained me at Talbot, you've given me the education you've called me to, you've given me everything that you've, you've planned for me to be here, but yet, a simple thing like that, I question who I am. I question am I able to do the things I'm called to do. And much like Solomon, he says, God, I am young, I am youthful, and I have little experience in leadership. And he even acknowledges that the people that are before him is great. It's a large number of people. Solomon, in a posture of humility, admits to God that he is unable to do it that he is fearful, that, that this task as king is way above and beyond what he is capable of doing on his own. So what does Solomon decide to ask? Look at verse nine. So give your servant a receptive heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. Of all the things that Solomon can ask for, he could have asked for more money. He could have asked for great mentors. He could have asked for, for godly people to serve under him. He could have asked for more alliances and political clout. He could have asked for more trading routes. He could have asked for every, anything and everything from God. He could have asked for more methods. He could have asked for anything, but yet the thing he asks for, God, give me a receptive heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil. God, give me the heart to know what is good and evil. God, no, give me the heart to know what you have called me to and what is of my own accord. God, give me the heart to know what is effective ministry biblically that you called me to instead of what's methodically going to work. God, give me the way of knowing what is good for your people. 
God, give me the words to say in the pulpit each and every week. God, give me a receptive heart. Notice he prays for a receptive heart. Solomon says to God, give me a heart that is understanding. A God that knows your, a heart that knows your will, a heart that knows your people. That you and I may know the answers to good ministry. And you and I may have been trained with the best Greek and Hebrew. You and I may know exactly what the word of God says and you can correct every mistake that's out there in your people's lives. You can lead a stellar Bible study. You can jam all the Greek and Hebrew you know into it. But what we need is a heart that is receptive. A heart that knows what God wants and what, what the people need. That when we pray for humility, God is going to give it. And in other words, what Solomon's praying for is the wisdom of God to do the work of God. The wisdom of God to do the work of God. That God, you have called me to this task and you will give me the ways to do it. That God, you've given me this task and you've called me to this ministry and to stand in that pulpit in front of you each and every week and even though I may have forgotten most of my Greek and Hebrew, sorry profs, but you'll give me the words to, to encourage your people. That your spirit would convict sins, that your spirit would comfort them. Solomon prays for the wisdom of God to, the, to do the work of God. My challenge for you this morning is simple. We can get out of here and have four letters behind our name and you can stand in a pulpit every week. You can sit in your church office and, and the first thing we're gonna hankering to be doing is that we're gonna try to find something to do to keep busy the next thing is we're going to try to read the book that is most up to date now of what ministry is like. We're going to attend all the conferences that we can get our hands on because the church is willing to pay for it. We're going to step into every method and every opportunity that's out there that says that we'll make church work. And we're going to be willing to, to, to sacrifice biblical principles and things we know that, that are, are what is intended by God for the sake of the next new method, the next new Bible study that's out, the next video curriculum that's out there, the next media podcast, the next whatever else. And I, I found myself sitting there yesterday in my church office thinking, I should pray for attendance. You know, follow up from, from Easter. Oh, I should be praying for more children's worker because the children population is growing. Or, or I should be praying for more Bible study leaders or small groups. I should be playing for, for small groups to multiply and, and to, to, to be more healthy or all these things that we can be praying for. You can be praying for a bigger church budget. You can be praying for trustees that will work with you. You can be praying for board members that are willing to, to, to be cooperative with you. You can even be praying for good skill in your preaching. But before we are willing to pray for those things, may we pray for a receptive heart. I and mean, we pray for wisdom from God to do the work that he's called us to. And notice what happens after Solomon prays this in verse 10. God gives him an answer for this. Verse 10 says this, Now it pleased the Lord that Solomon had requested this. So God said to him, Because you have requested this and did not ask for long life or riches for yourself or the death of your enemies, but you asked the sermon for yourself to minister justice. I will therefore do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and understanding heart so that there has never been anyone like you before and never will be again. In addition, I will give you what you did not ask for, both riches and honor, so that no king will be your equal during your life. If you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and commands just as your father David did, I will give you a long life. What's crazy is after Solomon prays this prayer for a receptive heart, not only is God pleased with it and God is impressed with it even, but God gives him everything that he did not ask for. That you and I may be praying for big attendance for methods that work for more children's worker, for more board members. But the moment we pray for wisdom from God to do the work of God, God will provide those things for us. 
God will give us those things that you did not ask for because God is gracious to us. And especially in this season of my life, I've experienced God's abundance over and over and over and over again. I've come to the point, God, why have you been so good to me? Really? And, and I've been praying, God, keep me in this place even when the times are hard. That even though ministry will not work out and even though members will, will come after me, even though children's workers are few, even though the trustees will have disagreements with me, even though the ministry may not be in the direction I think it should be going, God, remind me that you are good and you are faithful to me. Brothers and sisters, for those that are stepping into ministry or leadership or any of that, my challenge to you this, this morning is this. You pray for the wisdom of God to do the work of God. That before you know the right thing to pray, that you would come before God in the right posture. That you would come before him in a worshipful posture. That you would come before him humble, knowing that you cannot do it. That the task before you is too large. That there is no education out there, there's no method out there that would train you well enough to do the work that God has called you to. And that when you do so, you pray. You pray hard for the wisdom of God in your life. You pray to know the answer to when the two sisters are fighting over the nursery usage. You pray to know the answer to, to know where you gotta get that money for that, to fix that roof that's leaking and the rainy season's coming. You pray to know how to answer that dad who's coming before you with a wife that has stage four cancer. Because God is gonna give you the answers. Because God is gonna give you the wisdom in knowing how to do it. Because God is gonna give you the, 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 the way in which he's called you to in the ministry that he's called you to. Yesterday, I was sitting in the church office and I prayed this. And I prayed this for each one of you in here. I prayed that, that God would show us how to have a receptive heart to know good and evil. That in this day and this life that we are in, that we would be willing to hear from God first than, than from men. That, that before we're willing to take on the next method, their next Bible study, we would have a receptive heart from God to know what is good and what is evil that God would give us his wisdom to do the work of God that he's called us to. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.